got a job, and it starts first thing tomorrow morning. Former Prime Minister Trudeau is going to work for a Montreal law firm. Tom Kennedy reports. The firm is Heenan, Blakey, Jolin, Potvin, Trepanier, and Cobbett, and today everyone was smiling. I certainly consider it a big coup. I think it's a tremendous uh, thing for the firm. Pierre Trudeau actually has a lot more experience as a prime minister than he does as a practicing lawyer. He was justice minister for a while. Before that, he taught law. And before that, in the 50s, he did practice law. But ironically, he once told an interviewer that he had trouble taking it seriously. Since he retired, Trudeau's been living quietly here in Montreal. And he's been guarding his privacy. Here's what happened to one reporter who knocked at his door. Good morning, sir. Welcome home. People were not expecting today's announcement. It was easy to imagine Trudeau with a high-profile international job. It was not so easy to imagine him here at a local law firm. I don't like to think that joining my law firm is a demotion for anybody. We have a pretty high opinion of our, our firm. People who think that uh, Mr. Trudeau is going to come here from a nine-to-five basis to, to practice law have, I think, a, a wrong idea of what a law firm really is. Uh, he will be here, he will be uh, advising, but he will be talking to his friends, his clients, and his international um, uh, associations and, and contacts, and I'm sure we're going to see him doing a lot of that work. The Heenan firm is used to working with politicians. Ex-Liberal Minister Jean Chrétien and Donald Johnston have been through there. Peter Blakey is one of the partners. He used to be head of the Conservative Party. But Trudeau is special, and the marriage seems perfect. The firm gets his undeniable talents and prestige and experience. He gets an undisclosed salary and complete freedom to do whatever he wants. Tom Kennedy, CBC News, Montreal. There's a big flap over Joe Clark's trip to the United Nations next week. The external affairs minister was supposed to speak to the General Assembly on Tuesday. But CBC News has learned he's trying to switch days. He doesn't want to make his debut the same day Brian Mulroney's in Washington visiting Ronald Reagan. Terry Molesky reports. It was a warm gesture to a former prime minister, singling him out for a handshake at Monday's swearing-in. But it was not to be too long before Joe Clark realized that as the new external affairs minister, his first big moment on the international stage would be completely overshadowed by Prime Minister Brian Mulroney. On Monday, Clark was quick to tell reporters that he'd be going to the United Nations next Tuesday to speak to the General Assembly, the high point of the UN calendar. I will be at the United Nations uh, next week. It was to be Joe Clark's re-emergence on the world stage. At least it was until Brian Mulroney announced that he is going to Washington on the same day, Tuesday, to see Ronald Reagan. Suddenly, that turned Clark's debut in New York into a second-rate story. So tonight, on orders from Clark, officials at External Affairs are desperately trying to get out of the Tuesday date. They've already tried to get the Zambian ambassador, Paul Lusaka, to switch with Canada so Clark could speak on Thursday. In New York, the Canadian charge d'affaires has been to see Lusaka, while here in Ottawa, the phones were working overtime as everyone suddenly remembered their old friends in Zambia. But then, there was a change in plan. Clark now said that he wanted to go to a cabinet committee on Thursday, so the Canadian mission in New York had to go back to the Zambians and tell them to forget it. Tonight, the UN mission's best hope is that the nation of Sri Lanka will oblige and take Canada's spot on Tuesday so that Clark can speak on Monday. That way, he will still be overshadowed by Ronald Reagan, no less, who is also to speak to the UN on Monday. However, at least he won't be overshadowed by Brian Mulroney. Terry Malewski, CBC News, Ottawa. Mulroney's cabinet is the biggest ever, and the way he chose all those people is quite a story. CBC News has pieced together just how he did it. Among other things, Mulroney warned the candidates to keep quiet or else. It was his way of testing their ability to keep a secret. Jason Moskovitz has the story. When the Mulroney cabinet sat down for the customary group photo on Monday, the ministers had found out just moments earlier who else was in the cabinet. An elaborate operation had been in place for more than a week to make sure nothing leaked out, that everything stayed secret. On election night, Mulroney had ideas about his cabinet, but the hard decisions came later. Four days after the election, Mulroney went to a wedding in Montreal. In a car on his way to Montreal, he began to put his cabinet together. Mulroney traveled with Jean Bazin, an old law school friend and a Quebec organizer. They discussed the credentials of all the top-rated Quebec MPs. The decision-making process began on Highway 417. 
Two days later, Mulroney went to Quebec City. He had to make a customary constitutional call on the Governor General to tell her he was ready to form a government. That night, he stayed in Quebec City. At the Lowe's Hotel on three separate floors, three new MPs waited to be interviewed. Benoit Bouchard, Monique Vezina, and Michel Cote. They had been told to arrive at the hotel at different times. None of them knew the other two were in the same hotel, also waiting to see Mulrooney. On Tuesday, back in Ottawa, Mulrooney's office was staked out by camera crews and reporters. With every coming and going inevitably recorded, Mulrooney moved out. From his Parliamentary Hill office, he went to the Chateau Laurier Hotel. Rooms were taken throughout the hotel. Candidates were called in and kept in holding rooms, always on different floors, always with different arrival times. The idea was to ensure no MP saw any other MP. Besides Mulrooney, only three people knew what was going on. Norman Atkins, who ran the Tory campaign, Fred Doucette, a senior advisor to the Prime Minister, and Bill Neville, Joe Clark's former chief of staff and a Mulrooney friend. The three had lunch with Mulrooney every day through the three-day process. They discussed and they decided. Mulrooney's interviews with candidates were long and thorough. They were told if they said anything to anyone about the interview, they'd be out of the cabinet. In fact, people were never definitely told they were in the cabinet. They were told they'd be phoned on the weekend. One prospective minister, still not identified, did break the oath of silence and the cabinet job was taken away. On Saturday, Fred Doucette made the confirmation telephone calls and provided details of the swearing-in ceremony. On Sunday at Stornoway, the telephone was kept very busy. Old Clark cabinet ministers who didn't make it and those in the shadow cabinet who thought they should make it were telephoned and personally told the bad news. Fred Doucette talked to them first, then the Prime Minister did. Some of the calls went as long as a half an hour. On Monday morning, it was still a secret. At noon, limousines were lined up on Parliament Hill. The last organizational details had been carried out. The cars pulled out for the drive to Rideau Hall. Like clockwork, they arrived at the door one after another. Mulrooney's big secret was about to be revealed, but not a second before he wanted it revealed. The Prime Minister had tested every one of his ministers, and those who made it had passed his test of secrecy. Jason Moskovitz, CBS. On his way home tonight after his unprecedented 12-day visit to Canada, John Paul spent the last day of his grueling tour in Ottawa. He called for peace at a huge open-air mass. He thanked those who helped make his visit a success. And then he boarded a plane to take him back to the Vatican. We have two reports. First, Sheila McVicker. In Ottawa, at least for the last decade, September 20th has meant rain. And on the last day of John Paul's visit to Canada, that's how the day began. By the time the Pope had finished lunch, the skies had cleared. He had one last visit with ordinary Canadians, some in wheelchairs, who had waited through the rain to see him. And when he passed in front of the Peace Tower, the day had turned to glorious sunshine. The final mass. Tens of thousands gathered just below Parliament Hill. The famous and the not so famous. Again today, Pope John Paul talked about one of the major issues of our times. Earlier, he discussed the economy, unemployment, and technology. Today, it was war and peace. The Pope said all the money spent on arms deprives countries of the means to help their people. It is necessary to protect people from that. Millions of people from nuclear death and death from starvation. For the leader of one disarmament group, the Pope's voice is a welcome one. Uh, we're very appreciative that the Pope and the Church generally is warming up to the urgent need to uh, call on governments to stop this insane arms race. John Paul's message today was one of the most powerful he has delivered in his trip across the country. The nation's leaders were there to hear it. The question is whether they will act on it. Sheila McVicker, CBC News, Ottawa. In a moving ceremony tonight at Ottawa's Uplands Airport, Pope John Paul said farewell to Canada. Together, 
we have been able to lift a striking experience of the faith that unites us. The pontiff said he was particularly sorry that poor weather had prevented his meeting with native people at Fort Simpson. I truly hope that God's providence will give me another occasion to meet with them. Then the Pope added one of his unscripted comments. Excuse me, so uh, I invited myself to the second time into Canada. In his more than 60 speeches over the past 12 days, the pontiff has moved millions, including Canada's new prime minister, Brian Mulroney. He spoke of issues that touch us all, uh, none more importantly than the question of world peace. But he spoke of uh, problems affecting our youth and the tragedy that occurs when, uh, when we lose a generation because of uh, unemployment or drifting away from traditional uh, values. And, uh, uh, it was a deeply moving experience for the country. Uh, and then, with a final farewell wave to the crowd, it was into the special Air Canada jet and the final leg of the Pope's pilgrimage, his journey back to Rome. Mike Duffy, CBC News, Ottawa. Minister will be speaking at the United Nations on Tuesday, just as he was originally scheduled. As we reported on the National last night, Canadian diplomats tried to change the date to avoid a conflict with Prime Minister Mulroney, who was in Washington that same Tuesday to meet Ronald Reagan. A spokesman for external affairs says that effort has now been dropped. Canada's soldiers, sailors and flyers